I'll give you one more example for this. This is from a paper by Redelmeyer and Shafir. And they said, you know, would this effect also happens to experts? People who are well paid, experts in their decisions, do it a lot. And they basically took a group of physicians and they presented to them a case study of a patient. And they said, here's a patient, he's a 67-year-old farmer, he's been suffering from a right hip pain for a while, and then they said to the physician, yes, you decided a few weeks ago that nothing is working for this patient. All these medications, nothing seems to be working, so you refer the patient to hip replacement therapy, uh, hip replacement, okay? So the patient is on a path to have his hip replaced. And then they said, half the physician, they said, yesterday, you review the patient's case and you realize that you forgot to try one medication. You did not try ibuprofen. What do you do? Do you pull the patient back and try ibuprofen or do you let them go and have hip replacement? <laughs> well, the good news is that most physicians in this case decided to pull the patient and try ibuprofen. Very good for the physicians. The other group of the physicians, they said, yesterday when you reviewed the case, you discovered there were two medications you didn't try out yet. Ibuprofen and piroxicam. They said, you have two medications you didn't try out yet. What do you do? You let them go or you pull them back. And if you pull them back, do you try ibuprofen or piroxicam? Which one? Now, think of it. This decision makes it as easy to let the patient continue with hip replacement, but pulling them back all of a sudden becomes more complex. There's one more decision. What happens now? Majority of the physicians now choose to let the patient go to hip replacement. I hope this worries you, by the way. Uh, <laughs> when you go to see your physician. The thing is that no physician would ever say hip peroxicam, ibuprofen, hip replacement, let's go for hip replacement. But the moment you set this as the default, it has a huge power on whatever people end up doing. I'll give you a couple of more examples of irrational decision making. Imagine I give you a choice. Do you want to go for a weekend to Rome, all expenses paid, hotel, transportation, food, breakfast, the continental breakfast, everything, or a weekend in Paris. Now, weekend in Paris, weekend in Rome, these are different things. They have different food, different culture, different art. Now, imagine I added a choice to the set that nobody wanted. Imagine I said a weekend in Rome, a weekend in Paris, or having your car stolen. <laughs> now, it's, it's a funny idea, because why would having your car stolen in this set influence anything? But what if the option to have your car stolen was not exactly like this? What if it was a trip to Rome, all expenses paid, transportation, breakfast, but doesn't include coffee in the morning? If you want coffee, you have to pay for it yourself. It's two euros fifty. Now, in some ways, given that you can have Rome with coffee, why would you possibly want Rome without coffee? It's like having your car stolen. It's an inferior option. But guess what happened? The moment you add Rome without coffee, Rome with coffee become more popular and people choose it. The fact that you have Rome without coffee makes Rome with coffee look superior and not just to Rome without coffee, even superior to Paris. <clears throat> Here are two examples of this principle. This was an ad from The Economist a few years ago that gave us three choices. An online subscription for $59, a print subscription for $125, or you could get both for 125 <laughs> Now, I looked at this and I called up the economist and I tried to figure out what were they thinking. And they passed me from one person to another to another uh, until eventually I, I got to, the, to a person who was in charge of the website and I, I called them up and they went to check what was going on and the next thing I know the ad is gone and no explanation. So I, so I decided to do the experiment that I, do, I would have loved the economist to do with me. I took this and I gave it to 100 MIT students. I said, what would you choose? And these are the market share. Most people wanted the combo deal. Thankfully, nobody wanted the dominated options. It means our students can read. <laughs> but now, if you have an option that nobody wants, you would take it off, right? So I, took, I printed another version of this when I eliminated the middle option. And I gave it to another 100 students. Here's what happens. Uh, now the most popular option became the least popular, and the least popular became the most popular. What was happening is that option that was useless in the middle was useless in the sense that nobody wanted it. But it wasn't useless in the sense that it helped people figure out what they wanted. In fact, relative to the option in the middle, which was <coughs> um, get, get only the print for 125, the print and web for 125 looked like a fantastic deal. 
And as a consequence, people chose it. The general idea here, by the way, is that we actually don't know our preferences that well. And because we don't know our preferences that well, we're susceptible to all of these influences from the external forces, the defaults, the particular options that are presented to us, and so on. One more example of this. Uh, people believe that when we deal with physical attraction, we see somebody and we know immediately whether we like them or not, attracted or not. This is why we have these four-minute dates. Um, so I decided to do this experiment with people. I'll show you graphic images of people, not real people. The experiment was with people. I showed some people a picture of Tom and a picture of Jerry, and I said, who do you want to date, Tom or Jerry? But for half the people, I added an ugly version of Jerry. I took Photoshop and I made Jerry <laughs> slightly less attractive. The other people, I added an ugly version of Tom. And the question was, will ugly Jerry and ugly Tom help their respective uh, more attractive brothers? And the answer was absolutely yes. When ugly Jerry was around, Jerry was popular. When ugly Tom was around, Tom was popular. <laughs> This, of course, has two uh, very clear implications for, uh, for, for life in general. Um, if you ever go bar hopping, who do you want to take with you? <laughs> <laughs> you, want, you want a slightly uglier version of yourself. <laughs> similar, similar, but slightly uglier. <laughs> and, and the second point, of course, is that uh, if somebody else invites you, you know how they think about you. Now you're getting <laughs> What is the general point? The general point is that when we think about economics, we have this beautiful view of human nature. You know, what a piece of work is man, how noble in reason. We have this view of ourselves, of, of others. Uh, the behavioral economics perspective is slightly less um, generous to people. In fact, in medical terms, that's uh, our view. <laughs> but, <clears throat> but there is a silver lining. And the silver lining is, I think, kind of the reason that behavioral economics is interesting and, and exciting. You know, are we Superman or are we Homer Simpson? Um, when it comes to building the physical world, um, we kind of understand our limitations. Uh, we build steps and we build these things that not everybody can use, obviously, but <coughs> we build them. <coughs> we understand our limitations and we build around it. But for some reason, when it comes to the mental world, when we design things like healthcare and retirement and stock markets, we somehow forget the idea that we're limited. And I think if we understood our cognitive limitations in the same way that we understand our physical limitations, even though they don't stare us in the face in the same way, we could design a better world. And that, I think, is the hope of this thing. Thank you very much. <laughs>